Well, good evening, morning, and I'm I'm really excited to be with you guys today again. Although I will admit that somehow this is making me miss you a bit more because it's like you're kind of there, but you're not there, and I'm not there, and it's like oh my people. So <laughs> it's kind of been a funny thing this week is I've. I've probably thought more about Kawempe and the people there than I have in the last few months. Not that I don't think about you, but you know, it, because I'm preparing and praying a little bit more. And um, so right now we are in the season we call fall or autumn in North America. And one of the things that I noticed when I lived on the equator and that I miss very much because it's part of who I am as a North American is seasons and changing. And so for Ugandans, you have the big rain and the little rain and the big dry and the little dry, but your temperature remains the same and your vegetation remains the same and you still wear pretty much the same clothes. And about the only people that really pay a lot of attention to the season changing is the farmers for planting and harvest. And, and of course, you know, I learned that February is mango season and June is pineapple season. And so you have some of that, but here our seasons change completely. So we have just come out of summer and summer is similar to your big dry. It is hot, it is sunny, it is warm. Um, we wear shorts, your know, short pants, light clothing. We dress very similar to how Americans dress in Uganda because it's that temperature and it's that time. And even our activities change. We do things outside. We, um, we will eat out on the veranda as opposed to in the dining room. We will go to the lake for recreation. We travel because it's, the weather is good and, and things are set for travel. Um, and so it's a, but it's a busy time because we're trying to get everything done while it's warm. So we must be outside doing stuff. Then we transition to what we are in now, which is autumn. Now in autumn, it starts to get cold and our days get short. So in the summer we can have, um, I think our longest day, it is June 21st, the sun rises at six o'clock in the morning and it does not set until 10, 15 p.m. So we have like a 16 hour day before it's, it's night. And then it, it works up to that and then it gradually shortens. And in December, we will have the shortest day of the year, which will be uh, December 23rd. And then we will only have about six hours of daylight, but then it starts growing again. And so for us, our, even our bodies, our internal clocks are set for this, these changes in the time and the weather. Now, for example, it is, it is getting colder. Um, you, you never experience the cold of, North America in Uganda. But for those of you who have refrigerators, if you put your hand in your refrigerator when it is at the correct temperature, that is what it is like all day here. It won't get warmer than that. And then in winter, it will even get colder. And then we will have ice on the ground. So it will be like in your freezer. And so we change again. Everything that we are doing is changing. We put on heavier clothes. Um, we, were, we were teaching Isaac how to dress for fall. So he has to put on a, a thin shirt and then he puts on a heavier shirt or a sweater. And then he puts on a coat because as the day progresses and it begins to warm, you shed your layers. So you, by about one o'clock this afternoon, the coat is too much, you take it off. And then by about four o'clock, you might take off the sweater and just leave the thin shirt. And we are not outside so much. It's raining, it's cold. So we are moving to indoor activities. Um, 
we, our food changes. In the summer, we eat light, we eat cool things like salads and sandwiches. In the winter, we are eating the heavy soups. We eat more like Ugandans in the winter. Um, and then, so we're in fall, we're transitioning to the winter where then you will have your coat on all the time. You will never get down to the thin shirt. You will only go to the sweater. Everything is in that it is done in buildings. And then spring comes and spring is like a rebirth time. So even for our vegetation in the fall, our trees lose all of their leaves. You've seen it in movies and pictures. The leaves are falling. Then in winter, everything looks dead. You would think that the whole place has died. But in the spring, when the sun begins to warm again, the trees begin to blossom and there are flowers and birds are singing and we start transitioning back. This coat comes off, the heavy sweater comes off and then we move to summer. And we do this cycle every year. And so there are things that in each season we know it is time for us to do. We just automatically know it. No one tells us um, unless you've been imported. But for those who have grown in an area, no one tells us to put our sweater on. We know. But we know that we will take it off at a certain time. But we know in December the sweater will not remove. It will stay on. And then we, but we always have the anticipation that spring is coming and new life will begin and we will start the process. Um, because that, although our, our year begins in January, the world doesn't know that, the, the earth doesn't know that, the earth begins to reborn, rebuild and be born again in the spring. And so I was reading the other day in 2 Samuel 11, verse 1, and it, it's, um, it said, in the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war. Now, I did some researching because I thought, why are the kings going to war in the spring? Because for us, spring, you would be starting to plant and, and things are happening and we would not be fighting people necessarily but as I was looking they were saying that in the near east in the where Israel is during that time in the ancient days the winter was wet and there was mud and it was cold and so they did not they were not out again they were in their homes they were in their cities they were in doing doing things close by home because it, the weather made it such that travel was difficult. Similar to when you have the big storms of the rainy season and you know, if you live out in the villages, it can be very difficult to pass those mud paths. Um, if you're in Nongo, you know, the rice paddies have flooded, you wouldn't go in and out because it's not conducive to movement. And so in Israel, they waited for the winter to end. And then in the spring, the kings would go off to war. But this particular time, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. So, the, so his generals went and they took the army. They destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. And as I was doing my studying on this, there were some commentaries that were saying, well, um, it wasn't unusual for the kings to not go with their generals. Some kings would just send their armies out and they would remain. But we've seen from history in this that David moved with his armies. He went out when his armies went out and he partook in the victories. And even with it saying, but David remained in Jerusalem, it shows that this was out of character for David. This was not something that he normally did. And so we know as we read that story, then he saw Bathsheba bathing on her rooftop and he wanted her. And so he had her come to his house. They had sex, a pregnancy resulted and it led David into deception, resulted in a murder. Um, it was a bad time in David's life. 
And I was looking at it and it was like, what on earth happened? How did we go from David, who was a man after God's own heart, a great worshiper, a psalmist, a great king, a great leader. Just a few chapters earlier, he'd been dancing in the streets as he returned the ark of the Lord. Um, he, he brought it back into the city of David. He was to build a house for it. David was at the top of the world. He was doing everything right. He had the favor of God. And then all of a sudden, he is at the bottom. He's committing so many sins so fast. Most of us would just think he had gone crazy because no one would do that. You know, no one who is living in the blessing of God and doing great exploits a few days later to be, um, you know, fornicating and murdering because murder is kind of like the worst thing that we think a person would do to actually take someone else's life. And yet that's what he was. And so I was looking at it and it was like, what made this happen? How did this even occur? And one of the first things I saw was David was out of position. He was supposed to be with his men advancing the kingdom. He was supposed to be with his men taking care of the enemy. But instead, he stayed behind in a place of comfort. Instead of going out and fighting the battles with his men, he had retreated and he had stayed back. And he was, he was staying comfortable and warm and content in his palace and allowing the people, the men under him, to go out and fight the battle. So that was the first thing. David wasn't in position. He had, he had chosen a position of comfort over where he should have been. And by being out of place, he caused death and destruction. Now, on the battlefield, they were still winning. It says that they were, if you read that passage in, in 2 Samuel 11, you see that the army was still, was still being victorious. God was still working. God was still moving. God was still defeating the enemy. But at home, David was not partaking in any of that. Instead, he was causing problems. He, was ca he caused a death. He, um, he wasn't victorious in anything during that time his people were victorious but David could not claim those victories in fact his history of that the story that we have of him is about the lowest that it can be and God was was still blessing the Israelites and I was looking at that and I thought you know as a leader I want those who are following me to be successful. I want them to have great exploits and I want them to be doing mighty things, but I want to be with them. And some of that is because I recognize that the blessing of God is for all of us. And so I want to move with my people and I want to be positioned with them. I want to be positioned for the victories so that I can receive the blessing. I don't want to be sitting back in a place where everything is fine and I'm warm and comfortable and content because in those moments, that's when disaster can strike because I've, I'm not out doing what I have been called to do. Um, God has, God, has plans and purposes. He always has a plan. He always knows where he's going and what he's doing. And he wants us moving in those plans. He has a purpose for us. The Bible talks many times about the purposes of God in our lives, the calling of God in our lives. And we sometimes thwart what he has for us. 
Now he brings us back around because you know, God will not be denied. He will get his way. He will get what he wants. But sometimes it's at a big cost for us. And so David was bringing death and destruction instead of life and victory because he was neglecting his call. He was not where he should have been. He was not leading his people correctly. In fact, he was not leading them at all. The only leadership he gave was to organize the, the death of a friend. And so I was thinking, okay, so what do I need to do with this? Because one of the things that I'm, I'm really working with my young adults right now is don't read the Bible just to check off your 10 minutes of devotion today. You know, so much of the time we hear, oh, just take, take a little time in the morning and read the Bible, just 10 minutes. That's all it takes. You know, no, that's really not going to be enough. And definitely as a leader, if you're not spending serious time reading the word of God, applying it to your life, pulling the truths out of it. I mean, this is a, this is a Sunday school story. Okay. It, it is. It's, it's a nice story. But why is it in the Bible? Why is it in the word of God? Because we know that we are supposed to be, oops, sorry, we're supposed to be growing and learning, and we have the Bible to help us with that. And everything in there has a reason. There's something to glean from everything in there. And so I was looking at it, I was like, okay, I've heard this story all my life as a little girl, as a teenager, as an adult. And we always concentrate on, you know, David's sin and that we should guard ourselves. We should not be on the roof looking at the ladies, you know, but it was like, so he was out of position and he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. So how do we stay in position? How do we guard ourselves so that we don't fall into that same trap, into that same mess. And one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we are where God has called us to be. And we are doing what he has called us to do. And it might not be comfortable and it might not be easy. And it might stretch us just a little bit. Because we never grow without stretching. Um, if, if we're just content and everything is easy and pleasant as, as people, we tend to sit back and fold our hands and oh, this feels really good. I'm just gonna stay right here. It, but it's when there's a little bit of an irritation, there's a, there's a need that we're made aware of. There's something that, that pulls at us and we begin to say, oh, I should be out. I should be, I, I need to go out. God is moving me in this direction. God is, God is asking me to do this thing. And, and the, the great thing, and the one thing I'm very thankful for is that when God starts stretching us and when he starts moving us, he gives us tools. He never expects us to go and do without giving us what we need to get the job accomplished. Now, it still might be hard. Um, you know, a farmer has his digger and he has what he needs to till the soil, to plant the seed, but he's going to have to use that thing. It's not enough to just have the digger in his hand. He's going to have to actually go out and use his arms and use his back and till that ground. Um, you know, a businessman, you can give him a business, you can set him up in a beautiful storefront, you can put all the inventory there. But if he doesn't open his shop and actually sell to the customers, it's pointless. He's not going to make money. So God has given us tools, but if we don't choose to use them, then we will not accomplish what we were intended to accomplish. And so I'm going to talk about seven weapons that God has given us that are at our disposal if we choose to use them. And first of all, we have the word of God. 
which you all knew was coming because never ever will I te preach a sermon that I do not tell you your greatest weapon, your greatest tool, your greatest teacher, your, the manual for life is the Bible. It is the word of God. And unfortunately, right now, I am using mine to hold my phone up higher, so it's at a better angle for me. So I am not showing you my Bible. I'm also sitting in my office, and I am realizing I only have one Bible, the one that I use. So I can't even show you another one. But we have the Word of God, and it says it's the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6, 17. And a sword is a weapon to defeat the enemy. It is used to cut down those who are opposing. It was the main sword in the Bible. They didn't have a gun. It was the main weapon, I'm sorry. They didn't have guns. So of course you had a sword. And you had to maintain your sword. You had to sharpen your sword. You had to clean your sword. You protected your sword in its scabbard when it was not being used. And the word of God is like that. We have to use it. We, you have to open that thing. You have to read that thing. You have to apply it. You, you know, a soldier can have a sword hanging at his waist all day long. And if someone comes at him, he will die. Until he pulls that thing out and he uses it, it is of no value. And so you have to use the Bible. You have to use the scriptures. When Satan comes against you, you're not going to be able to argue with fancy words, with theories of men. Um, Zoe is currently taking a class called Biblical Worldview. And last night we were studying together and it was talking about the different, the atheists, the agnostics, the, um, we call them Dio-Darwinism, Darwinism, those who are using intelligence and science to prove that there isn't a God or that God is irrelevant or that God doesn't actually move in our lives. You can't argue on a logical scientific basis. You have to use scripture. And I, Zoe is learning what the word of God says so that when those arguments are brought to her, she can say, you are standing at a place of faith, believing that my God isn't real. I am standing at a place of faith, believing that he is real. And all of creation shows that he exists. And here is when creation began. And, you, and so using the scriptures, Jesus used the scriptures against Satan. You can use the scriptures against Satan. It's not going to be by reasoning that you are going to bring people to a knowledge and an acceptance of Jesus. It's going to be through the scriptures. Um, so get into the word, get to know it, internalize it. Don't just have it be something that you hear on a Sunday morning or that you use, even for some of us that are leaders, I catch myself only really delving into the word when I'm preparing a sermon or a teaching. And I've really been challenged this last year to be gleaning from the word for myself and for my family, not always for a session that I'm going to be teaching, not always for a lesson, but for my own personal growth so that I can present his word and present him in a timely and a good manner. Our second weapon is prayer. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That's Ephesians 6, 18. I know that you do the big prayer meetings and um, we actually open our week on Tuesdays. We have a staff prayer meeting for half an hour. Um, tonight I will be here early for Wednesday night for prayer. We have an intercessions group that meets and there, there are times of prayer, but it needs to be part of our daily lives. And I know that for some of you, you're like, ah, Shelly, I know this stuff. It's, you're teaching me what we teach the small children. And you're right, I am. Because some of us 
have gotten lazy in some of these areas. And we've decided that we're too busy or we're too cool or we don't need to spend that time in prayer. But I'm telling you that it, it doesn't have to be you only pray when there's a set of time for it, set aside time for prayer. Prayer should be part of your everyday walk. It should be something that you do without even thinking that you're doing it. Um, I, I catch myself throughout the day just thanking God for things. The other day, I was driving and we have a long street. It's straight through Roseburg. And it has about, I think there are 12 stoplights and they are timed. And I was in a hurry and I hit the first one and it was green. And the next one was green and the next one. And I made it all the way through on green. And when I got to the end of it, I said, oh, thank you Jesus for the green lights today. Because I needed that. I needed those lights to be green. And I believe that God intervenes on my behalf constantly. I think that all those little things that he does, there's also um, a song by Maverick City that's playing in my car right now. It was playing as I pulled into the parking lot. And it's um, little miracles. And it's that, you know, we look for the big things, but it's all of the little, you know, one, two, three, four little miracles every day that happen. And so I've started looking for just those little things that God is doing. And then um, worship is the third one. I, I praise and worship him. I thank him for what he is doing in my life. I thank him for who he has brought. Um, worship is an intentional elevation of God above all else. And I love the story in Acts 16, when Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, the other prisoners were listening to them. How fun. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken and at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. You guys, everyone in that prison was set free because of the praise and worship of Paul and Silas. I was reading that the other day and I was like, oh, my praise, my worship can set my neighbor free. It can set the person sitting beside me free. It can set my children free. My praise and worship opens the heavens it brings the spirit of God into a place and the spirit of God can affect everyone in the room. And it was like, how cool is that? I mean, I personally think that's really a cool thing because I want to see heaven on earth. I want to see the glory of God. I want to see my neighbors, my friends, my family, my community changed. And I am always looking for what can be done. Now, there's, there are things I can do in the natural, but I can do so much more just by worshiping God. He inhabits the praises of his people. We know that. We see it in Psalms and we see it worked out throughout the book of Acts and it overflows with blessing and our blessing when we are blessed, we have the opportunity to bless others and to just be in an abundance of good news and life for the world. Um, I know in, in Uganda, because I do read the news and I, I watch some of your TV and I, I watch reports, I'm, I'm still attached. I didn't detach from all of you. And so I, I've been watching and, and I, you know, I've been paying attention and it's, it isn't a wonderful place right now. You know, five years ago, if you had told me where Uganda would be today, I would be like, no, no, we're advancing. The economy is picking up and the, the businesses are coming in. You know, you were getting new stores and new 
new things were happening and your infrastructure was being built and and it was like you know you Uganda's on a on a good trajectory America was doing good um there were some things that were being set right and it seemed like everything was moving forward and things were going well and then all of a sudden 2020 hit and the pandemic and global shutdowns and um in america right now people are losing their jobs if they refuse the vaccine and we are seeing that the vaccine isn't as safe as we were told we were also in our country you know we have the constitution and we have rights and our civil rights and our government isn't supposed to make us do things and yet through the last couple of years we have been watching that eroding and we have been seeing mandates put in place and being enforced now not to the point where police are shooting us or beating us in the street um it's still it's still civil but there's an underlying unrest and there is a tremendous amount of fear people are afraid they're going to die they're afraid that the pandemic will kill them they're going to get covid they're afraid that their neighbor is going to give it to them we're fearing people they are afraid they're going to lose their jobs because there's going to be another shutdown they we fear the vaccine because it has side effects that aren't good for us and there's this continual fear that is being it's being promoted in our news and it's being it's become pervasive in our society and when i step back i i am not fearful i am never a fearful person i i know who i am i know who i serve i have complete trust in my god and i have even taught my children there are many things far worse than death so if i die i am sorry for the people who will miss me i will see jesus now not that i'm going to die soon or on purpose but that really is my heart but i have to bring hope i am bringing hope to people who are debilitated by their fears um one of my friends i spent yesterday evening with her she has gotten she is she's a christian but she is not strong she doesn't serve the lord strong and so she is very easy to be washed back and forth she is home on administrative leave from her job because of her stress and i had not been paying attention to her i thought she was doing fine and then i i got a hold of her and we were talking and she started sharing and i was like oh let me come sit with you tomorrow and i did i went and i spent some time just sitting in her sitting room talking and by the time i left she was laughing she had some plans for some projects and i had her i gave her some scriptures and i said i want you to read these scriptures i want you to look at what god really says and so take time to find people that are maybe not doing well in this time because they're there and maybe they're not the ones that are coming and seeing you but stop and think who have i not seen in the last few weeks who have i not heard from in the last month where is i know in the first shutdown i had contacted pastor robert and i said how are the jajas doing and he said oh you know i haven't seen them and then he checked and they were good and then i saw them right before i left but how are the jajas doing has anyone checked and how are some of your single moms doing i was excited to see the graduation pictures the other day because i you know women's empowerment program has always been dear to my heart and we're we're trying to get the funds to launch one in chihihi and i'm that's something i'm still i've got my finger in and um but how are your single moms doing it's been a long time it's been hard i know that you've had shutdowns and the transportation hasn't been working and um the kids aren't in school and that's added stress and so be checking on your friends and your neighbors 
we are all we also have the name of Jesus. So when Jesus left, we don't just have his name, we have him. He says in Matthew 28 that he is with us to the ends of time and to the ends of the earth. So you can't get away from him. He's there. Use him. He wants to bear your burdens. He wants to make your yoke lighter. You know, the, the parable about the, um, the sparrows and that he clothes the lilies of the valleys. If he cares so much for the flowers and the birds, how much more is he caring for us even in this time? So trust in him, rely on him. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. You guys, the name of Jesus is powerful and mighty. There is nothing anywhere that can stand against it. And there are times when I say just, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. And I'm not, I, I'm not using it lightly or for frivolously. I am calling on his name because there is nothing else to be done call on his name. He's there and he's waiting for us. He gave us all power and all authority in every kingdom and every principality. And we have permission to use his name. How cool is that? <laughs> we get to use Jesus's name and it will release the full glory of God to be manifested throughout heaven, earth, and hell. When you call on the name of Jesus, you release something powerful. We also have fasting. You people, you are pros at this one. My people, we are not so good at it. So I am learning that when God says, give this thing up, I give this thing up. And it may be for a season. Um, we usually talk about fasting and in food. And for me, there's a lot of foods that I can fast. But also for Americans, fasting media is a big thing. To turn off everything and just spend that time with God. And so I would, I would say beyond even the food fast, maybe, maybe ask God, is there something that you want me to give up for a season to spend more time with you? And to be able to move your hand. Because it does say in Mark 9, 29, this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. We move the hand of God through our fast. There are some strongholds we are never going to break with prayer or worship. We're going to have to fast. We're going to have to give something up. We're going to have to be serious. And God's going to have to see that we are serious. And then we can break through those strongholds. Sometimes we have to forgo our own comfort to bring about an eternal change. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're changing, we're changing mankind for eternity, advancing an eternal kingdom. We also have our testimony. It says they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Revelation 12, 11. Use your voice and tell your story. If you're listening to me, your leadership at Coempe, because that's what I was told this, this group was. So you have a testimony. You have a story. You have something good that God has done. Even just your salvation can break strongholds and can, can move, it can move mountains. You can't argue somebody out of their testimony. You can never, ever convince me that I am not born again. Do you know why? Because I was there when it happened and it happened to me. And I know that God transformed and changed me. I was seven years old 
when I was born again. That was a long time ago, almost 50 years ago. And in those 50 years, I have never wavered from the testimony of my salvation. I can still tell you where it happened. I can tell you what, what happened. It was a June 9th night. I'm not sure the exact day because I was seven. I wasn't paying attention, but I know it was in June because we had just gotten out of school. And there was a, a evangelist that had come through. And I was in a little tiny church that seated about 50 to 75 people in a little village of Yonkala. And there was a wooden altar at the front. And when that man said, come forward and be born again, I came forward and my little scrawny body knelt at that altar with that wood. And that man put his head, hand on my head. And I said that prayer and I became born again. You cannot argue that out of me. You cannot tell me that didn't happen because I was there. Use your testimony. There have been so many things that God has done in my life. There have been miracles that have happened. You can't argue them away from me. And when I start sharing them with you, it will encourage you in your testimony, or at least I hope it does. I would hope that you would be like, oh, I remember when God saved me. I remember when he did this. I remember when he did that. I remember when I was called into ministry. I was laying on a floor, slain in the spirit in a little summer camp in Medford, Oregon. And I heard the voice of God. You can't get that away from me. And I re when, when Satan comes at me, I say that. I'm like, no, no, I was there. I remember this time. And I use my testimony and I share my testimony. And it brings about power. When we speak the words, Jesus manifests them through us. When I share my story of salvation, salvation is manifested through my words. When I share stories of provision, when I share stories of healing, when I share stories of joy and peace, and the things that I've experienced, it manifests something in others. It brings those things to life. Those words go out. The Bible says that God's word is never returned void. The testimony of my life is the testimony of the gospel, of something that happened through me and in me because of the spirit of God. So those words do not return void. Those words bring life and they bring freedom and they bring a, an advancement of the kingdom. And finally, we have thanksgiving. Rejoice always, pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Now we've just started November and for us, the Americans, we have our Thanksgiving holiday at the end of this month. And so we are seeing in our supermarkets, on billboards, everywhere in America right now is Thanksgiving. And I love it because even, even the people who don't serve God are thankful. They stop and whatever, whoever being deity or whatever they want to thank at this time, they are thanking. And I am so thankful to Jesus. And when I give thanks, I can't be discontent. When you are being thankful for something, it's really hard to worry because you're thankful. It brings a, a renewal of our mind. It changes our attitudes. If I am thankful for something, I don't complain about it. If I'm truly grateful. And so I would say that you can release God's will into your circumstances when you acknowledge the good things that he's done for you. When you stop and you thank him for, for even the little things, again, the little miracles. And realize that all good things come from God. And so during this time, I would, I would recommend that you position yourself for the battle. 
that you get your tools together, that you get your weapons handy, that you get them, your, your sword sharp and cleaned off, that you get your armor on. Because I believe that we're moving forward into a time of victory, but a victory only comes after a battle. So we're going to be fighting. We're going to be fighting some battles. We're going to be fighting some strongholds and some principalities, but we know because of the word of God, we have the sureness that he's with us. And because we've read the end, we know that we win. We always win. And how frustrating that must be for Satan. How annoying that must be when I get up every morning and I start my day with, thank you, God. Thank you for a great night. Thank you for a comfortable bed. Thank you for home. God, thank you for my kids that I'm going to get up and take to school now. Because that's how I start my day. I'm like, thank you. Thank you, God. And then as we move through the day, I just find those little things and those moments. And um, he's so good. You guys, no matter what our circumstances are, God is always good. And he's always working in us and through us. But we have to be where we're supposed to be. We can't be sitting on the rooftop watching the girl next door. We need to be out with the, with the army. We need to be taking the land. Father, I just thank you for Coente Worship Center. And I thank you for these leaders and for today. Father, I thank you that on both sides of the world, we're doing your work. And we're fighting your battles and we're seeing your victories. And Father, I just pray today for me and tomorrow for them, God, that you would give them a great night, dreams and visions of exploits in you, and that tomorrow would be an amazing day and that they would just notice the little victories along the way. God, position them exactly where you want them to be. God, position me exactly where you want me to be. Father, that we would move in you and that we would be where we're supposed to be in this season and in this time for an abundant harvest for the kingdom. I just love you, God. Amen.